All right, amen. Well, we're in part two of our series, Eliminating Toxic People from Our Lives, and I'll give a little recap here in a moment. Uh, but the title of the sermon today is Snooze and You Lose, and we'll, we'll explain that here real quickly. So all that chapter, just to read this one verse, look down at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 6. It says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Now we're going to talk about um, three quarters of that verse here just for a little bit. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, he's saying, hey, you ought to have prudence. You ought to have some wisdom in your life, okay? And there's a certain types of people that we shouldn't invest in, okay? And we talk about the beginning of that verse a lot of times, you know, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. I'm not going to get into that right now, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll come back later on and, and deal with that. We've dealt with that a lot lately. But notice where he says this, neither cast ye your pearls before swine. Well, what would a pearl symbolize? Well, it symbolizes your hard work. It symbolizes your time, your energy, your effort, your emotions, everything that you've developed in your holy relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ since you've been saved. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't take those things and invest them in people that are like swine. Now, we were, uh, as I was preparing for this, we were kind of studying pearls and got the girls all excited, you know, jewelry and stuff. I've never been a big jewelry guy, but I didn't realize how difficult it was to actually harvest pearls, especially back in the time that Jesus actually said this. You know, today we have like um, these plants and you can get manufactured pearls and, you know, you can go on YouTube and pay a guy 25 bucks. He'll open one up for you. And, you know, a couple hundred bucks, you might have a, a, a earring or something like that. But obviously, the more that you add, the more expensive it becomes. But pearls are extremely rare and it takes a lot of work. And so uh, what we were reading is that you have you have to actually like dive 40 feet down into the ocean to actually get one of these things. Right. And you start digging up these oysters. You might not even get one for like 25 oysters uh, because concerning wild oysters. I mean, it's just not like every single one down there is going to have a pearl. So it takes a lot of work. Right, physically speaking. So go back to the, the Sea of Galilee, go back to the Red Sea, go back to the time of Christ. You know, these people were having to go out into the ocean, dive down, and actually turn this into probably an all week process just to get some pearls. So you can see that they're very expensive. So what does that symbolize? Well, it symbolizes value, it symbolizes hard work, experience, lessons learned, dodging sharks, all of these things. Look, the Christian life, look, getting saved is easy. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. We get that, right? But your discipleship, the stuff that you've done, you know, week after week, coming to church, soul winning, reading your Bible, meditating, all of these things, that is of eternal value. And what Jesus is saying, hey, don't cast these pearls, don't cast this energy before swine, people that have pig-like behavior because they will turn around and rend you. Understand what I'm about to say here. They will tear you apart. It's not, well, I'm a, I'm a good fool whisperer. I'm good at dealing with these people. I'm kind of like the lion whisperer. I'm kind of like the crocodile man where I can go and hang out with these things and they never bite me. I've got a special relationship. No, eventually you're going to get bit. Eventually you're going to get betrayed because that is what they do. And here's the scariest part about betrayal. It never comes from your enemies. And that's the bottom line for this morning. Understand that. Think about that for a second. It's not your enemies that betray you. Your enemies always are coming after you. That's easy. It's your friends. It's those that are close to you or those in your circle that maybe haven't become enemies yet. It's those that you've given some sort of trust to, those that are just, you know, at your work, in your family, whatever the case may be. But you have to understand the scariest part about relationships is that betrayal never comes from your enemies. Right? This is why it's so important that we understand who's around us, what their motives are, what we're dealing with so that we can protect ourselves. Because look, I've seen this even this week, even just recently, within 24 hours, you know, people that I thought were extremely rock solid, all of a sudden they're out. All of a sudden they turn their backs on a whole organization, on, on a whole church, on their family, everything, people that have helped them out. I mean, this is just insane, insanity. And you know, part of the reason is because we don't learn how to relate to one another. This is very, very important. So again, going back to the title here, uh, you snooze or you lose. So part of what I mean by that is if you snooze on the wisdom that's in the Bible in regards to dealing with other people, guess what? You're going to lose. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose uh, forward momentum. You could lose out on a lifetime of actually serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other application here is there's people in our lives that, like I said last week, they're not necessarily Judas's. Maybe they kind of got that Peter behavior, you know, which is just annoying, you know, and some people, they just need to be snoozed. Like there's people right now that we know that we've had to snooze them. We've 
we've had to take a break. We've had to, you know, socially distance them. They're not Judas's, but they just have some mannerisms that are contagious, that are bad. They keep us off balance. So we've had to actually place them outside of our circle, outside of basically casting our pearls and our time and our energy and stuff like that before them. Because what these people do is they trample them. Right, and who, who wants their efforts, everything that they've worked for, everything that they've believed, everything that they've developed, trampled underfoot? Because you know what, that's what pigs do, right? You go ahead and cast your pearls before them. Oh, look, I got a, a, this little necklace on a pig. It looks so cute. I'm gonna make a YouTube video about it. Yeah, the thing's gonna turn around and stomp on those things, get them muddy, and just take all that work that you invested in and turn it into absolutely nothing. Look, you have to understand, this is what toxic people do. This is, there's, there's no like, oh, but I'm, no. I'm not smart, you know, oh, I can, I can handle it, I can take it. No, you can't. They will tear you up. They will betray you. They will come after you. They, I, we talked about this last week. In fact, the bottom line from last week was in time, toxic people gain a certain degree of control over our lives, right? And you say, well, how, how is that possible? Well, it's because they keep you off balance. Remember, we talked about this. You know, if somebody comes up and pushes you, your natural instinct is to try to compensate. Well, when you're compensating, you're not on balance. That's what toxic people do to you. That's what they do to us. Because here's the thing, a lot of times we want to be liked by people. Everybody has that desire. We want to be liked by these people, you know, and toxic people have a good way sometimes of making you want to like them, making you want to earn their respect or maybe even be like them. And the moment you fall for that trap, you know, you won't be able to see it, but you're trying to be like them. You're trying to change the way you say things, the way you talk, the way you do business, whatever it is, just to please that person, right? And what they do is they leave little breadcrumbs of things out there that, you know, you, you look at like, well, if you, you say this, if you act like this, if you, you kind of subscribe to this, then you'll be accepted with me. The moment you do that, they turn around, oh, that's not how I would have done it. That's not what I would have said, right? And they just keep throwing you off. And you're just wondering like, what is going on with me? Is the problem me? And yes, partly the problem is you because you can't understand what they're trying to do to you. Okay. And again, not all toxic people are reprobates. Okay. Sometimes toxic people are saved, born again, Bible believing Christians who've just had their manners corrupted because of the influences and the crowd that they've been hanging out with in their lives. So this is very, very important for us to learn how to deal with this. And again, you snooze, you lose some people, you know what, you just need to lose them. Some people just don't learn. They just don't want to change. They just don't want to get right. And you need to put them outside. You know, Jessica a few years ago had to do this with, you know, what she would say was one of her best friends, you know, because of the whole, you know, Bible believing Christian issue. You know, she posted these verses um, about the Hallmark Channel, you know, because the Hallmark Channel wants to go all reprobate, you know, like all Hollywood does. And all these people that she thought was maybe cool with her, all of a sudden were like, you need to get with the 21st century here. You need to get on board with the program. Times have changed. You just shouldn't be so old fashioned. We're not in high school anymore. You know what she had to do? Just completely lose those people. Because think about this. How is she going to earn their respect? How is she going to maintain any kind of relationship? She's going to have to compromise. Right. And if you're compromising, you're compensating, they've got you off balance, they win, you lose. Okay, that is exactly what we are trying to avoid. And last week we talked about, probably the biggest thing of the sermon last week was the risk of eliminating people. See, there's a risk when you are going to go and eliminate somebody. And we compare Judas to Peter. Obviously Judas is far worse, but there's not really a whole lot written about him, right? And what we did is we analyzed his, uh, his discussion there, you know, with Jesus after the ointment fiasco and all of that. And we kind of, you know, talked about narcissism. And so even with that though, a lot of times you don't know because sometimes the behavior of Peter could almost be taken like the, the behavior of Judas, right? They were both kind of one-uppers, if you will, both kind of, you know, out for themselves, competitive, Lord, who's going to sit at your right hand, you know, all this type of stuff here. And so if we don't learn how to deal with these people, you know, it, we're going to, we could possibly risk losing the wrong person, somebody who can be restored, somebody who can change, somebody who can uh, eventually come back into our lives. Because sometimes people just need to learn manners. You know, not everybody who comes in here has got everything put together. Right. None of us do. Okay. But some people might be a little far gone than others, and they just haven't learned how to function in society yet. That's okay. That's what this church is for. We're here to help. We're here to deal with that. You know, the same thing is true though, at your workplace, you know, you might work with somebody and they're saying all this stupid stuff, right? And you 
you want to be very careful about just reprobating that person because if you do, you may not be able to give them the gospel later on down the road. Because look, people that are coming out of the world today are 10 times worse than they were when I was a kid, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, oh, he said this is definitely, you know, beyond hope. Right? No, we want to keep pushing and trying to help them out, but we may need to eliminate them and keep them at double arm's length until we see you know, some change, until uh, that process has settled down for a moment. Um, so again, what I want to talk about today is this, you know, once we wake up, what happens once we wake up and we realize, okay, you know what, this person's actually just been causing me to stumble, just, just kind of got me off balance here. I don't feel right around this person. I'm always like trying to gain a footing and, and it's just making me uncomfortable. I think I'm dealing with somebody that's toxic here. How do we do that? Well, I'll tell you right off the bat, the initial response that most of us have, if you're anything like me, is you want to get even. Okay, look, and I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. You want to get even and don't even lie. Now, some of you might be more mature and you understand that, but I'm just telling you right now, this is oftentimes the feeling that the old man's going to push up there and say, hey, this guy did you wrong for all this time. This guy trampled your pearls, your hard work. You need to recoup. You need to, you know, you need to regain some footing here. You need to do something to get even to get back. And I'm going to show you this morning why that is so dangerous, why we do not want to be like that. And I'll just tell you a couple of stories. I've told some of you guys this uh, in the past. Now, when I used to work for the government, you, you get a government job, man. It is hard to fire people. Look, there's people like, at the place I work, like if they didn't want to work, man, they'd just come in and sit down, kick their feet up on the table and be like, I ain't doing nothing today. And you can tell on them, you can write them up and you know what they'll say? Then what? Then what? You can write me up, then what? And they're right. <laughs> they're right. Well, you know, I kind of learned through the process of time on how to get back at these people. And it's very, very emotionally effective. One of the things that I used to do, because at my old job, we used to change shoes and stuff like that before we'd start working. Well, I'd come back to the office just a little bit early and I would take Chinese mustard powder and I'd pour it, you know, at the, in the toe of their, their, their shoes. Because by the time you get your foot in that shoe, you're committed and you can't feel it because it's real silky. Right? You go home, you take off your shoes and your, your foot's yellow and it's stained yellow. And I mean, it is awesome because they come back to work the next day and they are furious. I used to work with this guy, he was an electrician and he was, a, uh, he was like an eighth degree Freemason at the, at the lodge, right? Always blaspheming. So I, I mean, I'm like, I need to get this guy, man. I need to do something to this guy because he's super lazy. You know, I was a pipe fitter at the time. We're always having to help the electricians out. I'm like, this is wrong, you know? And of course, the, one of my friends at the time was an electrician. He wasn't helping the situation out. Like, yeah, we need to do something. I don't know what to do. I'm like, I got all these tricks, man, for being in the military. These things work like a charm, right? So we do that to this guy like two days in a row. He's coming back. You know, I know somebody in here. It looks like I got John. Is somebody in here is putting some kind of chemicals in my shoes, right? So he starts checking his shoes. Well, then I upgrade, okay? And then so what you do now, okay, don't do this, all right? So then what I started to do was to put peanut butter in the toe because when you shake your shoe out, that peanut butter sticks, right? So you go to put your foot in that shoe, you're committed. You step down, you feel that nice squishy feeling between your toes and man, I've got you, right? And it, oh, look, that felt great. To see the look of disgust on this guy's face sent me, Joe, look, I'll be honest with you, right now, I'm laughing inside and, and, and my old man is like, yeah, right? But there is a huge problem with doing stuff like this, okay? And I got all kinds of tricks. I'm gonna save those stories for another time. Wanna get a little more comfortable, <laughs> I just tease it. But look, here's the deal. <laughs> here's the deal. You know, we've all been told by our parents and teachers that if we get even, we're gonna feel bad. The problem is most of the time you won't. You're gonna feel good and you know that. Okay. You know that, you know, you, I felt great doing that. Right. I mean, I got new friends. People were like, dude, these tricks you got are great, man. Where'd you learn this stuff? What are we going to do next? I'm like, look, if, if he doesn't stop and change his behavior, I got more. I'll keep turning up the pressure until this guy gets to work. Okay. But did that work? No. Did it bring me satisfaction? Yes. What would Christ say? What are you doing? What is wrong with you? Just because this guy's a Freemason and he's lazy, whatever. Definitely not the way to go. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter number 25. We'll talk about why me doing that is so wrong, why it is not good. It is just absolutely horrible. <laughs> okay. Now in the new man, I'm telling you, hey, if I could go back, I wouldn't do that. Okay, but in the old man, I'm telling you, man, it, 
It was great. <laughs> it was great. So we're going to talk about uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 25 here. We're going to go through quite a few verses. This is uh, the time period in which David is running from Saul. Um, Doeg the Edomite has already, you know, done his thing. He's already come after the, the priest. Got, uh, you know, David is just distraught. He's upset. You know, the person who's supposed to be his family member now, his father-in-law has betrayed him over and over and over again, who is a toxic person in his life. You want to talk about being off balance. David right now in this situation is definitely off balance because David finds himself here in the wilderness and he finds that this rich guy named Nabal has a lot of sheep. He has a lot of wealth. He has a lot of, uh, food, resources, things like that. Well, get this. So while David's actually running from Saul, he actually protects the employees, the sheep shearers that Nabal has, which does what? Well, that contributes to the wealth that Nabal is about to discover. He's about to discover that he's wealthy. And so David is going to try to seek to get some help. But within this story here, right, we're going to learn some good principles here on how to deal with toxic people. I don't want to show you this here. So let's go through this here. Look down at verse number three. First Samuel chapter 25. Look at verse number three. It says this. It says, Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. So obviously, you know, the, the attitude and the zeal that Caleb had did not make it to Nabal, okay? Something happened along the way, and Nabal is just this egotistical, this maniac, this rich guy, you know, kind of like the person that you see every week, you knock on the door, and they're just like, <laughs> boom, slam the door, right? They want nothing to do with you. That is kind of how Nabal is here. He's churlish, meaning everything that he does is evil. The way he would talk to you is evil. He doesn't listen to rebuke. He doesn't listen to correction. He doesn't listen to anything. But then on the contrast, he's married to somebody who the Bible says is a woman of good understanding, of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. So see, me going back to the games that I play at work, you know, what would be written about me? This was a guy of, you know, not beautiful countenance, things like that, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to study kind of the way that she managed this relationship. Think about this here. Right. Obviously, David's, you know, in a toxic relationship. He's off balance. He's running around. He's about to do something or attempt to do something that is definitely not the right thing to do. But then you have this woman here who's of good understanding. She lives with an actual reprobate. She lives with somebody who is the child of the devil. And that's Nabal. So look at verse four. It says this. It says, and David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out 10 young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. Verse 7, And now that I have heard that thou hast shears, now thy... Um, it says, Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not, neither was there aught any missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. So David is just basically bringing a humble request before Nabal. You know, his men, they're tired, they're hungry. And think about this, they, they, they're, they're in uncertain times. They have no idea what the next minute is going to bring. They don't know when Saul's going to creep up behind them. They don't know when the Philistines are going to come. They don't know what nasty thing's going to happen to them next. But yet they see somebody else that they can help, and they actually, in the midst of all all that trouble decide to help this guy out they protect what is his and all he's doing is, is saying hey Nabal when you come out to shear your sheep right which is the time of year that people would actually find out how wealthy they were you know um, how, mu how much of an increase they got he's saying hey when you go do this you know, maybe you could just remember your servant, David. Maybe you could just understand that the reason why you have this wealth, the reason why that you have this increase is because we helped you. We're in need. Would you please help us out? Right. Not a horrible thing. Jump down to verse number nine. Look what it says. And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. That's important there, that last phrase, and ceased, meaning they didn't add anything to it. They didn't take anything away. They just said what had to be said, and that was it. They relayed the message. They relayed the intent. They relayed the humility, everything that David wanted them to. Now look at verse number 10. <clears throat> it says this, and David, or I'm sorry, and Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Now, what you have to understand here is he's not like, who's David again? Like, I've never heard of him, right? He's basically saying, who are you? Who do you think that you are? 
Why would I want to help you out? Right? Because obviously he knows his father's name. Yeah. And who's the son of Jesse, right? He's basically trashing his whole family, right? Who are you? Who's your family? You're nothing. He's like, I'm up here. You're down there. Deal with it. Get lost. Okay. Look at verse 11. It says this, shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be. So understand, this is a total disregard for the kindness that David showed Nabal, completely ungrateful. But what else Nabal is saying here is, I hope you starve to death. I don't care if you and the, you know, the 400 men that are with you, the 200 men that are back by the stuff. He's like, I don't care if they all starve to death and die. That's literally what, he's, what he wants to communicate to David. Talk about a toxic statement. Okay? Talk about a toxic person. And here's what gets interesting about this here. So Nabal, notice what it says there. Shall I then take my bread, my water, and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers? So notice this, this child of the devil. This reprobate here, he actually still takes care of his employees. He still feeds them, you know, because he understands without them, he's nothing. He's not going to get his increase. He's not going to get any work done, right? And sometimes people, when we don't have discernment and we see people doing things that they should be doing, we're like, okay, well, maybe there's still, you know, some hope for that person. Maybe I can invest in them. Maybe I can keep pushing forward. But the problem is if you ignore all the signs that we talked about last week, you're going to miss this. You're going to invest in the wrong thing. You're going to be up a creek. You're going to be in all kinds of trouble, right? Lastly, I want to mention this. What is Nabal doing here? Well, he's trying to reward evil for good. That's what reprobates will do. They'll try to reward evil for good. I mean, it's a great thing that David did. Really, I mean, even if he helps David and his men out, he's not losing anything. He's still even going to have more than what he started with. Think about that for a second. But yet he's like, no, I'm just, I'm just better than you. I'm just above you. I don't need you. Get out of here. I'm going to reward you evil for good. So look at verse number 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all these things. So the men do what they're supposed to do. They come back to David and they tell him the message of Nabal. Now, here's the thing. Look at verse 13. And David said unto his men, let's stop there. Okay, well, let's just go take some of his sheep. When we get our stuff, you know, figured out, we'll repay sevenfold. No, he doesn't do that. Does he say, okay, well, let's just go hunting. Maybe we'll catch some squirrels, you know, go fish for some fish. I don't know. We'll go get scavenge some berries. We'll go to the grocery store. We'll pray and ask God. No. What does it say? And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. This is us. <clears throat> you might be thinking, oh, that's just you. And you're right. Sometimes, look, that's me. Internally, look, let's just be honest today. When people do us wrong, even today, even yesterday in traffic, okay? And I'm going to say this right now. I'm just going to stop and disclaim this, okay? Work on everything else first and then the driving later, okay? Because you got to give me a pass on this. <laughs> well, when somebody cuts you off, you know you want to get even. But when somebody does us wrong like this and they say something, we want to get even, right? And you can say, oh, David, you know, he's just being, you know, maniacal or whatever here. He's being crazy. Look, this thing's in the Bible for a reason. This applies to us today because we want to get even. And you, if, look, if you're just honest with yourself, you know that's the fact. That's the truth. When someone does you wrong, your initial instinct is, man, I have got to get even. And that's exactly what David's trying to do here, right? He's going to say, hey, look, you want to talk to me like that? Let's go. Let's do something here. So now we have Nabal who's trying to reward evil for good. And we have David who's going to try to requite evil for evil. This is where we can find ourselves. This is pretty much a predictable thing in humanity. This is what we want to do. Look at verse number 14, because I'm going to show you, we're going to start to work up to, to the other one here and show you why this is so dangerous. Verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. Okay, so the men now, they hear that David's coming, and they're like, you know what? We know Abigail. She's got some sense. She's got understanding. We better tell her what's going on before we all die. Because understand, David's not just going to go kill Nabal and a couple guys. He's going to kill everything that moves, everything that lives, everything that breathes. Okay? And you say, well, why, how could he get so extreme? A man after God's own heart. Well, again, go back to his circumstances. Right? He's running from a toxic person. He doesn't know how to deal with that yet. We've all been there. We've all been there. We have to learn how to manage these types of people. Look, he's been on the run forever. You know, he's got the weight of those priests on him. I mean, he's just got a lot of stress on him. 
okay? And this is what I'm telling you, if you don't know how to eliminate these types of people, you're gonna make similar types of decisions. You're gonna be out of your mind, okay? So jump down to verse number 17. It says this. So the men of uh, Nabal, they basically just vouch for David. Okay, They're just like, hey, Abigail, this is what he did for us. He helped us out. He protected us. They were a wall unto us. They were a shield unto us. They protected us. So look at verse 17. Now, therefore, so this is the men talking to Abigail. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Right, so they, they, they're saying, hey, look, we realize he, he, he pays us our wages, whatever. You know, he's in management, he's a leader, whatever, but we can't communicate to him. There's no way we're gonna be able to go to him and say, hey, Nabal, the, you know, this guy helped us out. Why, you know, why can't we just give him something? You know, he's, he's gonna kill us because Nabal would have been like, oh, I'm telling him, bring it on. Right, that, that's what these people do. They're pigs, they turn around and just rend you, okay? The men understand that, and so they're like, hey, you know your husband's a son of Belial. What does that mean? A child of the devil. Right? When you're saved, when you get born again, you become a child of God. Once saved, always saved. Well, once you actually cross over the other way and you become a son of Belial, a son of the devil, guess what? You're that way forever. And they understand how these people are. And this goes back to what I've been saying. Toxic people always keep you off balance because you're trying to figure out how to get along. Okay? So understand that. This is why we need to deal with these people. So look at verse number 18 says this, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. Verse 19. And she said unto her servants, go before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal. Understand how she operates. Because remember, what does the Bible say about her? She is a woman of great understanding, of a beautiful countenance. And that's not just sometimes, that is all the time. That includes being married to this jerk, this guy who just won't change, this guy who won't listen, this guy who is only out for himself, doesn't care about his wife, doesn't care about anybody, right? She, in the midst of all that, goes above and beyond what David is trying to do here, okay? So please understand this. Look, jump over to verse number 21. It says this. Now, David, so this is David now, right? This, this is how we go here. This is how we handle our thoughts. We, we decide to, we got a reason with ourselves here. Look at verse 21. Now, David had said, surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him. And he hath requited me evil for good. See, this is the conversation that we have to pay attention to when we have it with ourselves here, right? That person did me wrong. I tried to do good unto them. I tried to get a little bit of help and they just wanted to repay me with evil, whatever the case is, right? This is us here. Look at verse 22. So, and more also do God unto the enemies of David. If I leave all, or if I leave all of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. So what is David determined to do here in his own heart? He is going to get everybody. He is going to kill 100%. And he would have been successful had it not been for Ab uh, Abigail making intercession here, okay? So we're going to jump down to verse 24 because Abigail, is, eventually she makes it down to uh, David, okay? Look what it says in verse 24. It says, when she got there and fell at his feet and said, upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Who's ever been in this situation before where you wake up in the morning, you got to go to work, you got a meeting to go to. If this person says one thing about this situation here, I'm going to blast him. You've got this grand like situation in your mind that you've rehearsed. If he says this, if she says that, man, I'm going to say this, this, and this. And you are a champion. You are an absolute hero in your mind, right? Then you get to work and they greet you with like a nice gift or they apologize and you're just like... <sighs> You start breathing heavy, like, oh, you don't know how to respond to that, do you? You're, you want to talk about being off balance. Now you're off balance. You know, they just apologized. You, you're ready for war, right? That is what people of understanding do. That is what people of a beautiful countenance do here. That's what she does to David, okay? So he's like, whoa, wait a second here. What's all this food, right? He's hungry. The men are hungry. He Internally, I don't think he really wants to do what he, he's about to do. And she's going to bring that to his attention. And notice what she does. She takes this responsibility on herself. She acknowledges him in a high regard by saying, my Lord, she's not saying, you know, my future husband, 
not my Lord and Savior, just saying, hey, you are a person of authority. You are a person that is of influence and in charge. Look at verse 25. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young man of my Lord, whom thou didst send. So notice what she, she doesn't lie. She doesn't say he didn't really mean what he said he, mean, he meant. She realizes this is the situation that I am. This guy is absolutely a man of Belial. He is a man of the devil. She's like, and I'm married to him, and I am sorry. She's like, you know, I wasn't there when you approached. I wasn't there. I didn't understand. I didn't know what had been said, okay? So what else, is, what does she mean by that? She's basically saying, hey, don't take it personal because he treats everyone like this. That's why this keeps coming up. And this is what we need to understand, especially about the sons of Belial, okay? About even not the sons of Belial, but toxic people, okay? They do this to everybody. But we have this tendency to want to take it to our own heart, to take it personal, okay? And look, if you're the kind of person, and we've all been there, that takes things personally over and over again, you can't be trusted. I don't trust people like that. Doesn't mean I'm going to be unkind to you. It doesn't mean I ain't going to work side by side with you. It doesn't mean I'm going to reprobate you. It doesn't mean anything like that, okay? It just means there's a certain point we're not going to get past because I don't trust people like that. I've learned in my life through several years of working with thousands and thousands of personalities, those people cannot be trusted. And that's just the way that it is. If you're easily offended, I don't trust you. It doesn't mean I won't eventually trust you. It just means, I, you know, there's, there's certain things I won't ask you to do because I can't trust you're going to do it, okay? You know, and every boss should understand that. Every father should understand that. Every mother should understand that. And you kids, you need to understand that too. You need to realize, you need to toughen up because the kids of this world today, guess what? They take everything personal. Yep. They take our YouTube channel personally. Yep. They take Pastor Menace personally, you know? Yep. Like, oh, you're talking to me, and you don't even know me. I bet so-and-so said this to this person, that person, you know, and all the way got all the way back to him, and it's all about me, 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 me. Right. <laughs> Guess what? We are all jacked up in some way, right. shape, or form. Yeah. Let's just understand that, okay? Let's just realize that so that we can build up and get over ourselves and not take things personal, okay? Right. And look, I'm telling you, this is hard for me. I take things personally. I've just learned some ways to kind of manage it and to kind of deal with it. And if you ever take your shoes off here, I'll put peanut butter. No, I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But here's the application here, okay? Here's the thing that we need to understand. What Abigail is telling David is when you get even with this guy, if you get even, then you're going to be even, meaning you are going to be equal. Meaning you are going to become like the person that you hate, like the person that is toxic. This was a hard pill for me to swallow. This is probably a hard pill for a lot of us to swallow. Understand that. When I put that peanut butter in that guy Mark's shoes and the mustard powder, I became like him. I, he brought me down to his level and he won. He won. He is now controlling me. He is now keeping me off balance because of my own foolishness. So understand that when you get even, you're even, meaning you're equal meaning you're no better than that person. So what's the alternative here? What's the way that we should go? And this is what is so hard to do, so hard to understand. Turn to Matthew chapter number five. Matthew chapter number five. And of course, none of us want to lose at anything. It's okay to be competitive. It's okay to be like that, but especially in the Christian life. Because like Pastor Menes says, you know, if you get bitter, you're not going to get better, right? That's just a fact of life, okay? And when we have this attitude of constantly wanting to get even, get even, get even, get even, guess what? It's just going to lead to bitterness because we're no better. We just stay stuck in that cycle, in that rut, and we can't get out. And the reason why we can't get out is because we're equal to that person by our actions. So I want to bring up something that people might say as a, 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 an objection here, right? Some people, and I've even heard this in my own life, you know, well, David would have been justified because he was a Jew. He could have gone up there and, and, and mauled down the ball because in the Old Testament, it was eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And ignorant people out there will often say this. Well, no, in the Old Testament, he had that right. Okay. That was his right. You know, Abigail should have just been quiet, whatever. And, and he should have been able to execute the Jewish conquest. Okay, this is what people will say. And they'll ignorantly say this. Well, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Is that how it was on an individual level in Old Testament Israel? Let's take a look. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. 
So Jesus says this, this is what they'll, they'll often go to here. They'll say, you've heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Keep your, uh, keep your place there, but go to Leviticus chapter number 24. Leviticus chapter number 24. Right, so understand the time frame in which Jesus says this, because that really is important to understanding the Bible uh, a, a lot of times. So Jesus is on this, you know, he's on the mount, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount here, and he's telling his disciples, he's telling the people that are listening to him, hey, you know, you guys have heard it been said before, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, okay? This is human tendency here. And what he's saying here is, you know, your leaders, these scribes, these Pharisees, these Sadducees, they're abusing this statement here. They're abusing this Old Testament verse here. You know, you guys shouldn't be like that. For one reason, first of all, is that you're under Roman control. So Jesus is telling these guys, hey, you're under Roman control. You no longer are privileged to your independent state laws that I gave you in the Old Testament. Okay, that's one thing that he's saying. But he's also going to tell them, and we're going to see this here in a little bit, there's a much better way. There's a way that's going to put you ahead. There's a way that is going to get results that will keep you above that other person here. But just so that we understand this here, what verse was he talking about? Well, there's, there's several places. We're just going to look at one. Leviticus 20, uh, 24, look at verse 20. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done un or to him again. Notice the last part of that verse. So shall it be done to him again. That doesn't mean that the person who was offended, the person that was robbed, the person that was assaulted, it doesn't mean that that person necessarily gets to execute the punishment whenever he decides it's fit. No, there was a government, there were priests, there were officers, there were judges, there were people that were supposed to make this public, okay? So when you're reading this chapter, we don't have time to dig into it, you know, a, a whole lot other than this verse here, but you have to understand, this was for public justice, not private revenge, okay? That is what Jesus was saying here. So this principle here that we're talking about here, you know, about not meeting people eye for eye, not becoming even so that we're equal and just like them, is even an Old Testament principle here. So it is true. Abigail is correct here, okay? Because I've heard it said, and I know this sounds crazy, but I've heard it said, she should have just been quiet. Because there are a lot of people out there, and these types of people are abusive. You know, where they've just got this view of women, like you should just always shut up. You just never have anything, you know, of value to say. And that is not true. She's the one that is actually the champion of this chapter here. Mm -hmm. She is the one doing the educating. She's the one we're learning from this morning. Okay. Now, does that mean, I'm, you know, we're going to invite the Abigails up to preach? No, we talked about that on Wednesday. Okay. okay. I'm just simply saying here that what she has to say is of extreme value. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter number 25. So please understand that that concept, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, that was for public justice, not private revenge. Okay. So don't let people tell you, oh, well, no, David was off his rock. He should have been allowed to, you know, commence his Jewish conquest. Okay. He wasn't even considered a Jew then. He was a Hebrew guy. Okay. Again, I don't want to open up that can right now. Let's move on with the story here. So we understand Abigail is telling David, hey, if you get even, you are going to be like him. Don't take what he says personally. He's a son of the devil. He treats everyone like garbage. Let's look at verse 26. It says this. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, as, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies... And they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. Okay, here's a great piece of wisdom for you ladies out there. And guys, I'm sorry, but I, this is just, I got to say this here. Notice how she talks to David. She talks to him with this loaded statement as if he's already done this. See, here's what doesn't work on guys, okay? Listen, you guys, you, you ladies, you want to be successful at communication? Listen to the way Abigail talks to David. Look at the verse again. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood. David hasn't agreed to that yet. David is still like in mid-motion, like, okay, what, what's going on here? She says, what, you know, she says what we just read in verse 25. He hasn't responded yet. He's just standing there like, okay, right? And notice what she says. She's like, you know, seeing the Lord hath withholding thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself. You know, you're better than this. You know, you, you don't do stuff like this, right? So when you ladies, you want to get your husband to do something, don't be like, you know, you're always so lazy. You always act like you're 12. You always do this because we don't respond to that. That just makes us want to keep doing it. And we will because we want respect, right? 
What is Abigail? She's a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance, and she knows how to communicate. So what does she do? You are so great. You are so wonderful. You're such an excellent leader. You're not like he is. That's how you talk to guys. Take it or leave it, but I'm telling you, it works. Okay, and I'm telling this so that the guys will understand, hey, let your guard down a little bit and just do the chores. That you know, <laughs> Do the stuff you know needs to be done anyways, okay, around the house. So look at verse uh, 28. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. And so David's like, really? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, me? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? So, ladies, when you want your husband to do something, you know, you're like, look, you are so good with the kids. You're so good at spending time with the kids, you know, and helping me around the house. You know, if you start the conversation off like that, they're going to be like, I am? I do? I do. I do do that, don't I? I am somebody. You're right. You know what? Yeah, well, where, what was that again? The, you want me to get the ladder out of the yard? You want me to get the paint buckets off the driveway? Whatever it is. Watch, I'll tell you, this is a game changer. This is a game changer. I'm telling you, it works. These things are in the Bible for a reason, because they work. Verse 29. Yet a man has risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall not be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God and the souls of thine enemies. Them shall he sling out as out of the middle of the sling. Well, what is she referring to there? His victory over Goliath with the sling, right? So she knows these stories and she brings that up. I, I, guys, I'm sorry, but this is, this, you know this works on us, okay? You, you know darn well. You know, so again, bring it up. You know, a couple years ago when you, you know, you, you were cleaning up the yard and you were mowing on a regular basis, you know, this is, that's how you got to start it off. Okay, <laughs> look at verse 30. I'm already in trouble. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning me and shall have appointed the ruler over Israel. So man, she even knows the prophecy. She understands Samuel came and dumped the oil on, anointed the oil over David, and he's chosen to be king, and she knows that David is running for his life. Look at verse 31. And this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord. Well, where's David at right now? He's standing there with a sword and 400 dudes behind him, ready to kill everything that moves in Nabal's house. And look at what she's saying to him, that this shall be of no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord. And he's sitting there like, you're right. You're right. So when people ask you, why did David marry Abigail? This is why. Okay. Because she knows how to get what she wants. Okay. <laughs> that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless. She's speaking to him in what she wants. Notice that. What does she want? What is her objective? To get David to not kill her and her entire household. Right? And she's just like, you wouldn't do something like this. You aren't going to shed blood causeless. You're a leader. You're going to be over Israel. You know, but she's not like, 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 like frantically panicking here. She's like, oh, please, please, please don't kill us. No, no, no. She's just like, look, you are a man of understanding. You, you know, this won't be any grief unto thee. And he's just sitting there like, you're right, girl. You know, this, that is so true. <laughs> so let's read the verse again. Verse 31. That this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offense of heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. That's why he married her. I'm not saying it's right. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy that he had multiple wives. But this is why he went back and got her. I'm sorry to say, but that's what it is. She has understanding. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day up to meet me. There you have it. She didn't panic. She didn't freak out. She didn't get even. She got results. This is valuable. We need to pay attention to this. Keep your place there. We're going to come back for just a couple of verses, but go. Um, actually, yeah, go if you would to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. So a quick review here while you're turning to Romans chapter number 12. So what do we have? Well, we've got, we've got Nabal, right? What's his goal? Reward evil with evil because he is evil. Okay, this guy is implacable, meaning he's impossible to placate. You can't play. You can't trust him. He is just bad all around. These types are kind of rare uh, in, in our lives, but they are out there and they are increasing as the day approaches. And then we have David. What's he going to do? Well, he wants to reward 
evil for evil. This is where we often find ourselves. I've found myself here many times in life. We all have. This is the most popular choice that people obviously make. You know, evil for evil, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And then we have Abigail. She decides what? She wants to reward evil with good. This is the hard one. This is where we have to eat humble pie. But it gets easier to eat that humble pie when you understand the mechanics of it and you understand this gets results. This does something to us. This puts us ahead, which is where we want to be, right? Romans chapter number 12, okay? This is the notable action, right? This is noble. This is like the Bereans. They were more, more noble. Why? Because they searched the scriptures. We as God's people, right? We want to be more noble. We want to keep our precious stones and build upon those things. And this is how we're going to do it here. Romans chapter 12, look at verse number 20. What does Paul tell the Romans to do? Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And uh, the, the problem today is that we're just told this. We don't ever break it down. You know, our parents didn't necessarily break this down to us. At least mine never did. Just said, you'll feel bad if you get even, Joseph. And I knew. But I was like, Mom, no, I won't. I'm going to feel great. I'm going to go to school and be a hero. I've seen the results. When I get even with people at work, man, I make friends. People want to hang out with me. They respect me. And actually, they kind of fear me, too, because they're like, I don't want you to do that to me. But that's superficial, okay? That's not right. This is the way to go here. Look at what he says in verse 20. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. We are not talking about reprobates or queers today. We're not going to help them out in any way, shape, or form. Okay, that is a whole other sermon, okay? You understand that here. But our enemies, okay, our enemies... I'm not going to bring them into my house and feed them, right. right? But if I can't get away from them and I need to eliminate them, I can still keep them at arm's distance. I can still do good things to them because even by doing good, it does what? It provides a good testimony, but also it heaps coals of fire on their head, meaning now you own space in their head. You are in control. You are running the show instead of becoming even, which is equal, which is like them, which is what we do not want. Go back, if you would, real quickly to uh, 1 Samuel 25, and then we're going to go back to Matthew, and we're going to wrap this thing up. So again, how does the story end here, right? That is what we want to see here. How does the story end? 1 Samuel chapter number 25. What does Abigail's advice ultimately do? Well, look at verse number 36. 1 Samuel 25, 36. And Abigail came to meet a ball, and behold... As he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. So she wants to wait till her devilish husband wakes up from his drunken stupor. Okay, look at verse 37. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became, notice this, as a stone. So what did Abigail's kindness do? It killed her husband. It heaped coals of fire on his head, which sunk down into his heart and literally paralyzed him. Verse 38, and it came to pass about 10 days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. So if we want the Lord to help us in these situations, we have to follow the Lord's programs. God's not going to help me put peanut butter in people's shoes. I wish he would sometimes, but I know better now. Okay, that is not effective. This is what's effective. And understand, it doesn't always happen this quickly. It doesn't always happen this way. It doesn't always happen this quickly. Again, understand that, okay? But it does happen. This is how you get results. This is how you get ahead. Don't reward evil for evil. We repay evil with good. Go back to Matthew chapter 5, and we're getting very close to being done here. So again, when Paul references that there in Romans chapter 12, you know, that's how you get the results. That's how we get God on our side to help us out here is by repaying with good, which again, it's hard to do. Look at what Jesus says about this here. Matthew 5, look at verse 39. But I say unto you, Matthew 5, 39, but I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. 
Okay, we're not talking about somebody attacking you, you know, just coming out of the woodwork and starting to throw combos at you, okay? Slapping you as like an insult. You know, somebody's slapping you, they're not trying to knock you out, usually. Most of the time, okay? So understand that here. And, and I know the guys in the shirts, and you know me. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm a, It depends on which side of the bed I wake up, okay? Pray for me. Pray for all of us. We need help, okay? Let's go to verse 40. And if, the man, if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Verse 41. And whosoever shall compel, uh, compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Right? So when that guy at work's like, who's not your boss is like, hey, why don't you do this? Do that plus one more. And you say, but I'm going to feel like he got me. No, you won't. God is going to help you in that situation because you're following the advice. You're following the path that he wants us to take. This is the Abigail way. This is noble. See, most people, we don't want to be like most people because we are the children of the king, right? And we want to act like it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. This is what we have to strive for. Because when you go to Man, that's a testimony. That's when people start thinking, wait a second here. This guy's different. This girl's different. This person is different here. They must have understanding. They're, they're, you know, and they're going to want to, they're going to trust you. They're going to gravitate towards you. And you can get more soul saved. You can get more effectiveness for the kingdom of God out that way. It's obvious. Look at verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Was that Nabal's attitude? Not a chance, not even close. So as I close the sermon, I just want to leave you with three things to remember real quick. We don't want to get even because then we're equal, meaning we're just like they are. That's the whole point here. You say, how do I eliminate toxic people? Well, when you discover them and you get that feeling, I'm getting back, I'm getting even, I'm going to do something about this. Don't get even because then we become just like them. And number two, we want to take that road that Abigail took. Because that's like the Berean way. That's the noble way. That's the way that says, hey, that person's been studying the Bible. That person trusts in the wisdom and prudence that God has. But what does that do also? That puts us ahead. When we become equal with the toxic people in our lives, they win. They've got you. They've got us. We lose. But when we take this route, we heap coals of fire on their head. That's just a, a good way of saying, hey, now we own steak. Now we bought property in their mind, and that is what we want. We want to get inside their heads. This is how you do it, Christian. This is how you do it. You want to get into people's heads? There is a way to do it. Romans chapter 12, the way that Abigail did it, okay? That's how we do it. We, we're going to decide right now. We're going to humble ourselves, and we're just going to repay evil with good. And guess what? We will be ahead. And guess what else that means? It means we're better. And I preached about this a month ago. There are some people that are better than others. And that's okay. That is a biblical concept. That is a biblical doctrine. This church is better than some other churches. Right. Oh, it's private. No, it's just a fact. It's just reality. Because yep. we actually believe the word of God, right. which automatically makes anybody better. Okay. Right. And lastly, I want to throw this out there, you know, or second to lastly, we don't want to be bitter. We want to be better. Pastor Manet says that all the time. And it is so true. The more we get stuck in that rut of just getting even, Bitterness will set in because it doesn't work over time. It just, you realize that next thing you know, you just, you're going to be like David. I'm killing everybody. Are you going to try to up the ante? You know, David was like, I'm not just going to get even, you know, he's threatened to kill me. I'm going to kill him and his whole family. Okay. It, it's just this perpetual cycle. It just never stops, right? It just never stops. And lastly, think about this, you know, how do you want this to be talked about in the future? Right? How do you want the story to be told about your situation? And I think when you realize these four things, it's going to help you make the right decision when it comes to eliminating the toxic people, dealing with these toxic people that are in our lives. Okay, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you again so much, Lord, for uh, just these excellent truths that are in your word that uh, pray to help us to remember this. Lord, it's very important that we remember this, apply this to our lives so that we can live the way that you would want us to live and be more effective for your kingdom. I pray that you bless the fellowship after the service. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. <laughs>